what are you doing here? There's no new episode for you. I told you that the podcast is bi-weekly now. But I do have something. No hour of the show is immune to cuts, trims, and assorted edits. Sometimes there are things that I'm dying to talk about but just can't fit in an episode or doesn't work into the flow. So I offer you a deleted scene from Chapter 9. Please enjoy. How do you syndicate a two-hour comedy? Better question, how do you syndicate anything that's two hours long? There is no slot longer than an hour, so you'd have to cut the original program in two. Upside, extra episodes. Downside, this isn't something that just a creative mid-episode edit will solve. Comedy Central had been pestering Best Brains for a more manageable version of Mystery Science Theater 3000 for most of the show's life, both for syndication purposes and just to meddle. And in 1993, the Brains finally relented to the pressure and began collaborating on a shorter version of everyone's favorite Cowtown puppet show. First, they selected 30 choice episodes from the 3rd, 4th, and 5th seasons. Cave Dwellers, Gamera, Pod People, Time of the Apes, Daddy-O, The Amazing Colossal Man, Fugitive Alien, It Conquered the World, Gamera vs. Giron, Earth vs. the Spider, Viking Women and the Sea Serpent, War of the Colossal Beast, The Unearthly, Santa Claus Conquers the Martians, Space Travelers, The Giant Gila Monster, Teenagers from Outer Space, Hercules Unchained, Hercules Against the Moon Men, The Magic Sword, Tormented, The Beatniks, Crash of Moons, Attack of the The Eye Creatures, The Human Duplicators, The Day the Earth Froze, Manos the Hands of Fate, Secret Agent Super Dragon, The Magic Voyage of Sinbad, and I Accuse My Parents. The cast and crew came up with the perfect format. Each episode would be divided into two separate hours, both bookended by short host intros and outros. The second hour intro devoted to recapping what happened in the previous hour. That way the viewer could follow the movie even if they caught it for the first time, but were only presented the back half. And they had some thoughts about a potential host, A&E mainstay Jack Perkins. The problem. Mr. Perkins was not on the Best Brains payroll, but someone else was, Michael J. Nelson. Mike had played Perkins in the host segments for Experiment 310, Fugitive Alien, as a long-winded doofus who would take every possible opportunity to blather on about tangential topics of no consequence. Kind of like this podcast. Mike's Perkins was less an impression than a separate character with unique quirks inspired by a real personality's propensity to overpraise and end sentences very late. Who better to introduce an edited MST3K? In the summer of 93, that's the summer of Jurassic Park to you millennials, a set was built in the studio of KARE11, Golden Valley, Minnesota's NBC affiliate. It's a simple, almost sparse, blue-keyed setup with a platform in the shape of a film reel in the center, stylized portraits of Dr. Forrester and TV's Frank hanging on the back wall, with Mike slash Jack usually standing in front of a row of three frame photographs from the movie of the week. Best Brains resident makeup artist Chris Ballas created a new, more complex version of the earlier Perkins makeup design that was astonishingly effective. To add mystique, the name Jack Perkins is never actually used. Well, to be frank, it was 50% mystique, 50% legal liability. The Mystery Science Theater Hour had a specially composed score, framing Mighty Science Theater as a gentle piano number that was eventually reused in Season 8 when Pearl Forrester formed her own PBS-like public television station. It went something like this. Hello. Good evening and welcome to another experiment via the Deep 13 Laboratory. Tonight's movie, Earth vs. the Spider. Yet another Bird Eye Gordon Dada S masterwork. It's a breathtaking phantasm of a remarkable small town in America where something goes horribly, horribly wrong. All too often in America's history has a group of hardworking pioneers had to fight against a seemingly immovable foe, Three Mile Island, Pearl Harbor, and of course when Gary died on 30-something. The opening theme would be my favorite thing about the syndicated version were it not for the end theme during which the lights in the studio faded out and Jack slash Mike's silhouette would do a bit of visual shtick, everything from chasing a stagehand with a scimitar to laughing maniacally to beginning to choke and having to be saved by another stagehand.
I particularly love the way the theme gets more overbearing and abstract as it goes. I assume Mike performed it, having written many a song for the show on his keyboard. Fun fact, for the only time during the show's run, Kevin Murphy and Trace Beaulieu are credited as executive producers during the closing crawl. Funner fact, I may be the only person who finds this interesting. Mike's Jack Perkins is on point throughout the remarkably short introductions and wrap-ups, rarely running longer than a minute and a half, but packing plenty of jokes, fake trivia, and recycled props from the corresponding episode's host segments. Here's a rundown of the highlights. For Fugitive Alien, Jack makes no mention of having appeared in that episode. Weird. The Unearthly features one of Jack's most peculiar attributes, referring to things that remind him of Satan. Crash of the Moons has the most quote-unquote informative intros, although every compliment delivered is backhanded. Hello. I was just picturing myself a master of special effects, making people's visions come to life no matter how fantastic. Today's feature, Crash of the Moons, has plenty of taut drama peppered with mind-bending special effects. It was the Captain EO of its time. <laughs> that crow makes me laugh. You know, I even tried building a replica of my favorite automaton, but I cut myself and had to stop. Cut myself rather badly. Crash of the Moons was a feature version of the Rocky Jones TV series. It was hoped that the Rocky Jones series would spawn a string of highly successful films. It didn't. Well, that's all for now. Join us next time for the Mystery Science Theater Hour. For Manos, the Hands of Fate, Jack shares a thought about Torgo that tells you more about his life than you ever need to know. Torgo appears to lack hygiene skills, and were I to meet him in person, I have a feeling he'd pack a stench that could knock a buzzard off a gut wagon, <laughs> to borrow one of Pop's saltier tropes. Speaking of odor, you know, dear old dad could get pretty ripe after a day of splitting wood. Secret Agent Super Dragon features a different kind of overshare, which I have to assume Frank Conniff had a hand in, given his love of spy movies. My name is Dragon. Super Dragon. <laughs> You know, as a kid, I was not exempt from the powerful lure of super spydom. Casually winning millions of some foreign money at exotic casinos, pistol-whipping thick-necked henchmen, drinking champagne from the belly buttons of women who later try to stab me, and darn it, I wanted that license to kill. But then I got into voiceover work and the dream faded. Well, see you next time. Bye bye And appropriately, the final MST hour, I accuse my parents ends with the aforementioned darkening of the studio and Jack breaking down and crying, ending up in a group hug with various stagehands. The Mystery Science Theater Hour originally ran on Comedy Central from November 1993 to December 1994 and was syndicated to local non-cable stations by Tradewinds Television from September 1995 to September 1996, presumably ending when the show proper migrated to the Sci-Fi Channel, which was owned by Universal as, as opposed to Comedy Central's parent Viacom. No episodes of the show exist in a complete form, but can mostly be found on the corresponding episode DVDs from Rhino Home Video and Shout Factory as supplements, with a few exceptions. I strongly recommend that you buy them to check them out, but if you just want to be a freeloader, you can scour the internet for them. They're probably there. This is Ryan Rodriguez, signing off.